Hello, and welcome to Final Show Films. I'm John, the executive producer here, and I've got a few pre-show notes for you. First, a reminder. All of the content we produce is available on our website at finalshowfilms.com, as well as youtube.com slash sensaku, sensaku.podbean.com, twitch.tv slash sensaku, and on iTunes. We are only able to do the things we do thanks to the kind support of our Patreon donors. We give a special shout out to our $25 tier supporters, Antitonic and Cat Waterflame. If you'd like to support us that way, be sure to check it out. Secondly, a thank you to the folks over at 411mania.com. They produce articles and content related to wrestling, MMA, movies, music, and gaming. Go check them out. We appreciate their support as well. And lastly, be sure to subscribe, comment, and rate, if possible, wherever you listen to or watch our content. It helps us know what you like, what you don't like, and helps us make more content. Feedback is always appreciated. With all that being said, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Yo. Ha! <sighs> so today, we are making NPCs for d and I'm John, obviously, and I'm also a game master for Dungeons & Dragons and do a lot of stuff uh, related to that, which is probably why you're here, if you are interested in that kind of thing. I'm, uh, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna be using my Grand Terra Rebirth uh, um, Roll20 session to document and, and go through the process of building NPCs. It's not to say any of these NPCs will show up in Grand Terra. It's not to say that none of these PCs will show up in Grand uh, NPCs will show up in Grand Terra. This is just the it's if if any of them do show up, it's easy to have them there. And if they don't, well then they won't. Um so anybody who happens to be a player of mine in those games, uh you may or may not see these guys again in the future, and if you do, they may or may not be in the same form that you see them today. Uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and get some music back on. Uh, I'm gonna have... Just, I like to listen to music while I'm making NPCs, so... And we, have, we are currently listening to the uh, Overclock Remix uh, Final Fantasy playlist. So, I find it to be particularly... Uh, stimulating. Let's go ahead and get into the thing. Alright, so... Uh, what the hell are you doing? Why are you doing it? Alright. Yeah. Stop it. Stop with the heavy shadows, Curtain. Oh well. I don't really care that much. Okay. So. The first uh, NPC that I'm going to be using, um, that I'm going to be making, is a... Turn that on a little bit, it's a little distracting. Um, is going to be uh, a, a, a established NPC, just so I can go through the mechanics and the breakdowns of doing it. It's actually a character that I've wanted to make as an NPC for a while. Um, and I'm gonna, so I'm going to be making Elminster. So let's go ahead and... Uh, and for those of you that have never made NPCs in Roll20, uh, you'll get to see how we do it now. Elminster, as far as I know, has not yet been made, like, as an has not yet had, like, an official template for 5th edition. So, we might be the first. Um, so, while I'm making the character sheet, I always, I always have a, if it's a, if it's going to be a named NPC, and it's not one that I just pull out of my head, like Fred the Halfling, um, then I always have a token made of them. So what I do, just to give you an idea of the amount of books that I have, um, uh, I have a program called Token Tool that I use to make tokens. Um, and I do this primarily for myself, just in case I ever want to use these portraits. But also because it keeps everything sort of in line in my head. What is this? Give me something more upbeat. OCR, come on. Oop. That's all I meant to do. There we go. All right. Uh, so yeah. So first, I start off by making token because it helps me 
So I go into one of my many, many archives of character art, and I have already picked, already grabbed Elminster's art. Elminster has official art, so. Um, do do do. Unlock this. Oop, fuck, wrong way. 500 by 700. There we go, that's a portrait. Alright, so... Put the artist credit there. Eh, I'm trying to include the artist credit at least. Oh well. We typically use our character art from... I, I, I pull art, I have a vast archive of art from Pinterest, and I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't claim any of the art that I use as my own. I don't try to make money off of any of the art that I use. Pointedly, I don't put ads on my shit, so... Um, and if anybody asks me to, take, to not use their art, I will. But, for now... Save... Uh, Elminster Portrait... And... I'm gonna give him... A token as well. So I color code my NPCs, uh, gold for allies, red for enemies. So I'm giving him, and, and then silver is player characters, I'm giving Elminster a separate um, token border here because he, could have, he sort of doesn't really fall into any category that, uh, that you could make there. So I then come over here and... Gather my art. <laughs> Gather my token. And save. Elminster is a medium sized creature after all. So, uh, we're going to make Elminster. How do we make Elminster? Well, first we need to, look, we need to know a little bit about Elminster. Because, because we're using a we're making an established character in D&D lore. We're going to go ahead and look at what he has previously been. Um, estimated to be. So, 3.5... He had one level of fighter, two levels of rogue, because he started out as a fighter rogue. He started out as a fighter rogue, and then received the blessing of Mistra, uh, becoming her chosen, and other things, uh, which is when he became a cleric for three levels. And then he's got 24 levels of wizard and five levels of archmage. So what we're saying is, he's pretty fucking big up there. Second edition, he's a 29th level wizard. First edition, he's a 26th level magic user. So, we're gonna probably go along the 3.5 scale of idea. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna use these. So we're gonna start out as a multi-class fighter rogue wizard. I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna cut the cleric out. We're gonna go fighter rogue wizard and take a look at that. Um, I'm not sure if we can go above 20th level, but we're gonna try. So, the first thing we need to know is multi-class rules. So 5th edition has very specific rules about multi-classing and that you have to have specific requirements that you meet those requirements uh, when you uh, want to go into multi-class. For instance, and, and sometimes I bend those rules, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not always strict on them, but when I'm building, when I'm building NPCs, I try to go by the rules as much as possible so that my players understand that I'm being fair. And I build NPCs by building player characters. So I don't enforce, uh, I, I enforce the same rules on my NPCs that I don't have player characters, and that being a cool book. So, uh, to qualify for a, new for a new class, you must meet the ability score prerequisite for both your current class and your new one, as shown in the multi-classing prerequisites table. For example, a barbarian who decides to multi-class into the druid class must have both strength and wisdom scores of 13 or higher. So... If we're going to be a fighter rogue wizard, we need to have strength or dexterity 13 for a fighter, dexterity 13 for a rogue, and intelligence 13 for a wizard. So really all we need is a 13 intel, a 13 or, or better intelligence and dexterity. So, 
Um, when I have my player characters, whenever I have my players create a character, I have them roll either either do one or two things: roll for stats or um, use a stat array. And in this case, I'm going to use an array because uh, it's you know it works. Um, eight, and my array is 18, 16, 14, 12, 10, 8. So I'm going to have our 18 in intelligence, 16 dexterity. Actually, we're going to have our 16 in Wisdom and our 14 in Dexterity, 12 in Charisma, 10 in Constitution, 8 in Strength. Not that it necessarily is going to matter because he's Elminster, but... Uh, so, we meet the requirements of having a 13 or better Dexterity and a 13 or better Intelligence for all the multi-class that we're going to do. So, our first class is Fighter, because he started off as a Fighter. Then, we go over here, our second class is Rogue, with two levels of Rogue. And then our third class is Wizard, with, um, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll go with the, we'll, we'll see what we can do with the, um, Cleric 3, and then our fourth class is Wizard. 24. And let's go to 24. Actually, uh, if we're counting Archmage, because that doesn't exist in 5th edition, then Archmage of 5, so 29 level. <laughs> level 29 wizard. Alright, off to a good start. Uh, Fighter 1, Rogue 2, Cleric 3, Wizard 29. Race, Humane, not that it matters anymore. Alignment, Chaotic, Good. I stress that good is not actually what Elminster is, but he's listed as chaotic good, so we're gonna go with chaotic good. Background. All right, so this is this is sort of a new thing for fifth edition that we didn't have in Thermo Five, so we have to we have to ourselves determine what we think Elminster's background is. So Elminster started off as a fighter and a rogue, in sort of a mercenary company situation, and then he. Um, eventually became the Chosen of Mistra and the Goddess of Magic, and as such, became... Hey, Auntie, welcome back. Uh, welcome to the stream. Thank you for your subscription for five months in a row. Um, so, uh, he, when he became the Chosen of Mistra, that's when he gained his clerical and wizard powers. So, what do we want to do here? Um, for background. Flip into the book. Actually, I know what we're going to do. Uh, I, I've, most of my books are in PDF. I have physical copies of several of them, but I, yeah, I even have PDF versions of those because it's, it's easier to build NPCs if I have the stuff in front of me rather than in my lap. So let's pull up our Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. A little now from Wizards of the Coast. Um, yoink. This handy dandy PDF. Um, which all of these PDFs you can buy on RPG, uh, on, uh, um, drivethroughrpg.com or directly from Wizards of the Coast, or you can buy hard copy versions at your local game store. So, support Wizards, support your favorite com support your companies that make stuff that you like. I do. All the time. All, every chance I get. Uh, okay. Uh, so. I'm looking at background stuff, and because Elminster is originally from Faerun, Faerun seems to be a good place to go for background. So, what do we think? What do we think he was? He was sort of a sellsword mercenary kind of person. So, hmm. We're gonna we're gonna have him for now. We're gonna have him be a faction agent because he is a member of the Harpers. Um, so faction agents. 
Uh, many organizations act active in the North and across the face of Faerun aren't bound by strictures of geography. These factions pursue their agendas without regard for political boundaries, and their members operate anywhere the organization deems necessary. These groups employ listeners, rumor mongers, smugglers, sellswords, cash holders, people who guard caches, wealth, or magic for use by factions operatives, haven keepers, and message drop minders, to name a few. At the core of every faction are those who don't merely fulfill a small function for the organization, but who serve as its hands, head, and heart. Um, Elminster sort of serves as the Technically, he's a member of our organization, but we don't ask him any favors. So we're going to say that's the bowels of the Harpers. Um, so, faction agent. Boom. Done. All right. What do we do from there? Uh, remember the Harpers? Founded more than a millennium ago, disbanded and reorganized several times. The Harpers remain a powerful behind-the-scenes agency, which acts to thwart evil and promote fairness throughout, no throughout through knowledge rather than brute force. Harper agents are often proficient in investigation, enabling them to be adept at snooping and spying. They often seek aid from the other Harpers, sympathetic bards and innkeepers, rangers, and clergy of gods that are, that are aligned with the Harpers' ideals. So, as a faction agent, we get... Uh, insight and investigation. Yeah, we'll say insight and investigation because that's what the Harpers get. Two languages of our choice and some stuff that doesn't some stuff that isn't really important. So as much as I build um, as much as I build NPCs to be player characters, I completely and always ignore their equipment because their equipment that you get from your background and your class doesn't necessarily matter because I'm building them as an NPC. It, it would matter if I were playing them as a player character, but in this particular case. I just tend to ignore that. They they have as much money as they need and whatever items they need um, to for them to fill the role that I have in mind for them. Uh, feature safe Hagen as a faction agent. You have access to a secret network of supporters and operatives. So what I'm going to do in order to work with this because I'm not I'm not pulling that out yet. I'm going to go use window popouts for character sheet. Pull up Alminster. Put him over here. Pull that right there. <laughs> All right. So. Insight and investigation. All right. So uh, his wisdom and his intelligence saves. Right? Wisdom, and intelligence, based skills, which he has pretty good scores in. So that's nice. So we're already seeing sort of. Even though I already know where Elminster is going to end up being, we know we sort of have an idea of what role he would fill if he was any other NPC. Uh, here, feature. Spell feature right. No, what am I doing? Safe Haven is a feat is a background feature of the faction agent. As a faction agent, you have access to a secret network of supporters and operatives who can provide assistance on your adventures. You know a set of secret signs and passwords you can use to identify such operatives who can provide you with access to a hidden safe house, free room and board, or assistance in finding information. These agents never risk their, l their lives for you or risk revealing their true identities. Alright. Fucked up assistance there, but that's fine. So. Safe haven. Complete there. Um, suggested characteristics uses the acolytes background from the handy dandy player's handbook. So, let's look at the acolyte. And again, much like when I'm making player characters, you can, you can, you can roll for your background stuff. I don't. I pick my background stuff because. That makes it more interesting. Like, I, I mean, you can... I, I, it's not necessarily not interesting if you roll randomly your background traits, but I find that it's better if I'm building a character that I build the character, rather than letting rather than letting um, the dice decide. That's that's why I like stat arrays a lot, especially like the 18 to 8 uh, stat array, because if you're building the character, you're constructing them, so you know what they're going to be good at, what they're going to be bad at, out the gate. Um... Do, 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 do. Okay. Personality traits. What do we have for Acolyte? Um, so we can use one of the eight uh, that is listed in the Acolyte 
uh, page. Uh, I idolize a particular hero of my fates and constantly refer to their per that, that person's deeds and example. I can find common ground between the fiercest enemies, empathizing with them, and always working towards peace. I see omens in every event and action. The gods try to speak to us. We just need to listen. Nothing can shake my optimistic attitude. I quote or misquote sacred texts and probably almost every, every situation. I am tolerant or intolerant of other fates and respect or condemn of the worships of other gods. I enjoy fine food, drink, and high society. I spend so long in the temple that I have practical, little practical experience. So none of these really, um, none of these really uh, little practical experience. None of these really fit uh, Elminster as we know Elminster to be. Elminster is uh, far more a hermit than, uh, than, than this would indicate. So, instead we're going to look at these personality traits and see what we can come up with that's similar maybe in theme but not necessarily along the same line. Um, I would just normally pick one of these if this was, if this was anybody other than Elminster. But. So... No, 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 no. Actually, that that is something interesting. I misquote sacred texts and proverbs in almost every situation. So, Elminster does talk shit a lot. But he doesn't necessarily talk shit about like sacred texts or, or bring them into a conversation. So what can we put what can we change this to to be more in line with Elminster? Well Elminster will 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 often make references that do not fit into the uh, um, plane that he's currently on. So, rather than I misquote sacred texts and proverbs in almost such a situation, I constantly refer to things that may or may not be real and may or may not be in this uh, original to this this incarnation of our world. So it's along the same lines as that, but it, it like, it, it's, you know, rather than the god Helm once said, smash the infidels, uh, it's more talking about, you know, it's more making sort of Deadpool-esque uh, fourth wall breaking references. Hey, did you read that? Uh, you remind me of somebody from a comic I once read. Archie Comics, are you familiar with that? To somebody in favor, you know. Ideals for the Acolyte. Tradition. The ancient traditions of worship and sacrifice must be preserved and upheld. A typically lawful ideal, not Elminster at all. I always try to help those in need, no matter what, no matter what the personal cost. Charity. Good. Another not really Elminster ideal. We must help bring the changes the gods are constantly working in the world. Close to Elminster, but not quite. Uh, I hope to one day rise to the top of my faith religious hierarchy. Well, Elminster's already there, so not that one. Um, I trust that my deity will guide my actions. Nope. <laughs> I seek to prove myself worthy of my god's favor. Again, no. So we're going to go... We're gonna, again, we're, we're, there's not quite one that works here, but we're going to go with... We must help about the changes the gods are constantly working in the world. But again, um, Elminster only really cares about one god, his girlfriend, Mistra. Um, so it's not quite there. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to modify this. Um... We must help bring about the changes the gods are constantly working in the world. It's an awkward sentence. We must constantly bring about change. We must constantly bring about change. Uh, we must strive. We must help bring about change. We must strive to reinvent ourselves and our world. One step at a time. We must, we must strive to reinvent ourselves and our world one step at a time. That, that, that's, that's more Elminster-esque. Bonds. 
I would die to recover an ancient relic of my faith that was lost long ago. I'll someday get revenge on the corrupt temple hierarchy. You're going to be a heretic. I owe my life to a priest who took me in when my parents died. Everything I do is for the common people. I will do anything to protect the temple where I serve. I seek to protect... So, uh, so actually, there's one right here. Everything I do is for the common people. Except, this is Elminster. Everything I do is for... The fun of it. Or to preserve our world, whichever I feel like at the moment. A little bit more wordy than the original one, but that's that's definitely the Elminster feel. <laughs> and flaws. I judge others harshly and myself even more severely. So that's almost Elminster. There, that's Elminster. I judge others harshly. So we have our background sort of set up for Elminster, so let's go to Fighter. Well, first let me look at the multiclassing rules again real quick, because there's nothing, something I'm not 100% clear on yet. And that is, how do our proficiency bonuses work? Do we get the ones... Do, how do how do we acquire proficiency bonuses as a multi-class? So, multi-classing option. Uh, experience course cost of gain is always based on your total character level, so... That's fine, whatever. Uh, proficiency bonus is always based on your total character level. It doesn't get higher than six, so that's fine. Proficiencies. When you get a level in a class other than your first, you gain only some of the classes starting proficiencies as shown in the class and tables. Okay, so we start with we start as fighter, which means we get our fighting proficiencies. Wizard gets nothing, rogue gets light armor, one this one skill from the class is skillless and thieves tools, and so we're gonna what we're gonna do then is we're gonna have our first level have been in wizard. Then we're going to go Fighter Rogue Cleric and get the... There's a table on page 164 of the Player's Handbook that tells you what proficiencies you get. Uh, because we're building from the ground up, it doesn't necessarily matter what level they started in. And, and sometimes the rules don't quite work the way the story does. But um, there are certain things that we, that we want Elminster to have been able to do. So we're going to have to play around a little bit with his... Uh, with his sort of um, map, you might say. So. I'm just trying to figure out what we're going to do for the 29. Anyways. Excuse me. Alright. <laughs> 35 hit dice of varying types. Actually, that's a good question. What hit dice does he use? Hit points and hit die. There we go. You get hit points from your new class as described for levels for after first. You gain the first level first level hit points for a class only when you are a first level character. Add together the hit dice uh, by all your classes to form your pool of hit dice. If the hit dice are the same die type, you simply pull them together. For example, both fighter and paladin have d10s. So your fighter, you know, 10 d10. If you guys do, so your fighter, you have. Oh, so you have. Okay, so we have. I think rogue, cleric, and wizard all have the same hit dice, and fighter doesn't. So we have one d10. Uh, we're gonna put this. In, <laughs> just additional traits and features. Hit dice spread. One d10. Let's take a look at the others. Visored, D6. Rogue, D8. Cleric. D8. So, we have... 1d10, 5d8, and 29d6.
Lots of lots of fit dice. Also, age question mark. Just gonna put that there. No one knows Elminster's age. His age is in his age is just uh, an infinite loop. All right. So we're gonna give him those proficiency levels, proficiency stuff from Wizard first. Let's go to Wizard. Uh, starts with. Not gonna worry about his gear provisions. Ah, oh, well, might as well. Oh, sorry, that's a tool thing. Wrong one. Other proficiencies. Here we go. Weapon. Daggers, darts, slings, quarterstaffs, light crossbows. Intelligence and wisdom. Actually, what we should do in, in order to in order to make that work, we should go wizard twenty nine, and then over here make that fighter one. There we go. There we go. That works. So intelligence, wisdom. Choose from two. Arcana, History, Insight, Investigation, but we've already got inve Insight and Investigation, so that's fine. Um, Arcana and... Religion. Alright. So, this is going to be relevant later. <laughs> okay, so, heading back to our multi-class page. Fighter gives us light armor, medium armor, shield, simple, and martial weapons. So I can basically go, you know what, instead of all this, simple, martial, simple, and martial weapons. And I can go armor, light, medium, and I can go... Uh, sorry, light, medium, shields. Yeah. And that's it. And then I get uh, thieves' tools. And one of the rogues' skills. One of the rogues' skills. Acrobatics, athletics, deception, insight, intimidation, investigation, perception, performance, persuasion, sleight of hand, and stealth. Um, perception, we're gonna say. Alright. So, starting with the classes that we only have a couple levels in, because that's gonna be easier, next we go into our. Um, well, first we, first we apply our racial bonus for being a human. Uh, we're gonna use the variant rule, which is. Um, so, the variant human rule, which is available in the book. Uh, that instead of getting plus one to all ability scores, a variant human gets uh, two different ability scores of their choice increased by one. We're gonna go intelligence to 19, and we're gonna say wisdom to 17. He's a smart guy. Uh, and an additional 
uh, trait, uh, additional skill of our choice, so... I like having all the intelligent stuff up high. History. And... A feat of our choice, so... We can go to these feats and take a look at them, which I will do. See if there's anything that really, you know, scratches an itch, as it were. Canis, not using UA. Uh, uh, we are using we are using the UA, um, but I want to see. I basically just want to see what we are, what we have access to in the PHB first, and then I'll look through the Unearthed Arcana. Also, welcome Zagrog to the stream as we make Elminster. So, uh, things we have: alert athlete. So, I, I want something that's going to increase his intelligence. To get get that up to twenty. So, let's see what we have available to us in the PHB first. Because Elminster is viciously smart. So things that jump to mind. Keen Mind is a good one. And actually is probably what we're going to go with for his starting uh, feat. Because Elminster is ridiculously smart. Keen Mind reads, You have a mind that can track time, direction, and detail with uncanny precision. You gain the following benefits. Increase your intelligence score by 1 to a maximum of 20. Uh, you always know which way is north. You always know the number of hours left before the next sunrise or sunset. You can accurately recall anything you have seen or heard within the past month. Yeah, we're going to go with Keen Mind. So we're going to go ahead and... We're not going to put the details in there because I can easily find it back in the book. But Keen Mind and... It, uh, which is a first level human feat. Which increases his to 20. And basically he has all this other stuff. Um, yeah, no, that... Uh, uh, Elminster's mind is like a steel trap. In fact, many people have gotten caught in it. So... We've got his feet. We've got his racial stuff down. Um, Elminster, I'm, I'm just going to put uh, uh, all... I'm just going to put... I'm not going to worry about what languages he, he knows, because Elminster is the type of character that knows all, that knows all languages. So. Continuing on. We might get Arcanist, but that depends. Um, Arcanist depends, Zagrog, on what we do next. So, uh, starting with his first level, which is fighter, um, we have... What does, what does the fighter get at first level? As I sift through my stuff. Uh, Alright. Fighter... First level gets fighting style and second wind, which is not bad because a wizard having second wind is actually pretty useful. Second wind uh, class fighter first level. Uh, so second wind, you have a limited use. You have a limited well of stamina that you can draw on to protect yourself from harm. I have to read up so I can talk in the mic. Uh, on your turn, you can use a bonus action to regain hit points equal to 1d10 plus your fighter level. So, it's not great, but it's still something. Uh, once you use this feature, you must finish a short or long rest before you can use it again. So, we have one second wind, uh, once per short, long rest, regain 1d10 plus 1 hit points. No, 1d10 plus fighter level hit points hit points. And I'm going to go ahead and correct my spelling of Second Wind. And I'm going to actually make that a, uh, a, a roll that happens. So. Healing. 10 plus 1 currently. Second Wind. 
So, if I ever just want to, boom, I have it ready there. Go ahead and test this out real quick as I pull up my rolls. I'm going to set this to always whisper to me so that I don't worry my uh, players when I when they come back into uh, the game. He healed for five. All right. Second wind is working. Um, and then he gets a fighting style. So what fighting style do we think suits Elminster? Um, being a wizard, it doesn't really matter because he can do almost anything. But the ones that we have presented in the book are archery, plus two to attack rolls made with ranged weapons. Defense, when you're wearing armor, plus one to AC. That's not really all that good, all that important to us. Dueling, when wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, you gain plus two bonus to damage. Go up and fighting, protection, two up and fighting, and then we also have some unearthed arcana stuff we can take a look at. Let me pull in my... So, there is a collection of all the unearthed arcana stuff that is currently, that has not yet been published. Uh, when Xanathar's Guide, when Xanathar's Guide comes out, a lot of this stuff is just gonna go in a bin somewhere, but, um, for now, uh, that collection is called the Codex of Unearthed Arcana. Let me pull that up here. And... Extras fighting styles. So we also have close quarters shooter, uh, lets you make ranged attacks in close quarters without uh, having a disadvantage, and makes you, lets you mix ranged attacks is important here, because what that m ranged attacks does not say ranged weapon attacks, nor does it say ranged magic attacks. So basically, close quarters shooter, as it's written here in this PDF, means that any ranged attack you make does not suffer disadvantage in close combat, and ignores half covers and three quarters covers against targets within 30 feet of you, and has a plus one bonus to attack rolls on ranged attacks. So we're, we're gonna take close quarters shooter, because that what that means is if you're within 30 feet of Elminster, he does not, if you're, if you're within melee of Elminster, he does not suffer disadvantage for trying to say chromatic orb you, or firebolt you, or blight you, or or finger of death, or any number of other spells that uh, not finger of death. Finger of death is a saving throw, but yeah, but um, but yeah, any any ranged spell that he might make that requires an attack roll doesn't have disadvantage. So that's real good for a wizard. Um, so we're gonna take, and that also saves. Uh, well, it doesn't exactly save us. It saves us. There is a feat that does something similar, but. Um, that saves us a feat, basically. Uh, close quarters shooter. Range attacks in melee do not have disadvantage. Plus one if target within 30 feet. Oh no, actually, that's a separate clause. Plus one, it's just plus one to all uh, ranged attack rolls. Um, and ignore half cover or three quarters cover if within 30 feet. All right, that's actually better than I thought it would be. So, yeah, we've got a close quarter shooter fighting style. So that's his fighter levels. Let's go to rogue. Two levels of rogue. Yink. What do you get for two levels in rogue? Well, you get a lot. If I, can find, if I can find the class. It's right next to where I'm turning it bet. Yep, there it is. Okay. So. Two levels of rogue gets us, an, gets us expertise, sneak attack, and thieves can't. So, uh, start with expertise. Expertise, we pick two spells. We take are not spells. We take we pick two skills that we are already proficient in that we want to be doubly proficient in. So, uh, Zagrog, you said we might want Arcanist, but we don't necessarily need it because we have expertise here. 
Uh, I know the bonus things that it can do are nice, but since our intelligence is already 20, we want to mitigate the amount of feats we might be using for it, that, that that we sort of lose viability on when we're uh, when we're uh, getting stuff. Now that's that's not always the case. I'll, I'll stress. Um, it's not always the case that you'll want to skip a feat just because you don't get uh, all of the all of its benefit. But I, it, when I'm making an NPC, I like to avoid that just because I, you know, it's what I would do if I was being as a player character. So, uh, our expertise options are Arcana, History, Insight, Investigation, Perception, and Religion. I'm going to go with Arcana and Perception, uh, as those those are two fairly good things, and it also sort of tells us a little bit about Elminster, again, what's important to him. Magic and being able to see shit. So, Arcana and Perception have expertise. So now we have plus 17 to our Arcana rolls and plus 15 to our Perception rolls. There is very little in the world that Elminster does not know about magic. And we also get Sneak Attack, which is currently a 1d8, a 1d6. Why did I put Ranger first level over here? Let me fix that. And we get... Thieves Cant, which is a language. I'll put over here. And we get... Cunning Action! We'll go ahead and make a sneak attack thing up here as well. It is not an attack, it's something that happens at the end of an attack, and it is simply 1d6. Okay, who doesn't want an extra 1d6 on the occasional hit? Anyways. Just bonus, really. So that's what we get as a rogue. Hey, John Lucko, welcome to the stream. Welcome to us making Elminster for 5th edition D&D. And eventually other things. <laughs> like having extra dice? Yes, no. Who uh, Rolling extra d6s when we hit things is really nice. Especially when we have access to things like close quarters. So close quarters shooter has a couple of different combinations now. So in addition to us not having disadvantage on range attacks, say we're surrounded by enemies and an ally has come up to help us and is flanking us with an enemy now, um, or at least is in combat with that enemy now, when we hit them with a firebolt from 30 feet away, um, we ignore their cover if there is cover, and we get to add an extra d6 to our 5d10 that we're rolling, or 4d10, however, whatever the cantrip is at, at this level. Um, as well as having a plus one to our attack there. So, like, like synergy between synergy between abilities is, is important, at least for this character. Not necessarily for all characters, but for Elminster, synergy between abilities is important, because he's like that, yo. Alright. So, after that, I'm going to swap these around so you guys can see elements are better. Um, hmm. After that, we need our three levels of Clark. So, flip to Cleric. Not Barbarian, before Barbarian, uh, after Barbarian. <laughs> Min maxing is perfectly in flavor for Elminster, yes. Yes, it is. Alright, so we have three levels of cleric. But the the divine domain that Elminster has is not in the PHB. So we're gonna start by looking at the things that he gets for being a cleric. Uh so at third level he gets spellcasting, obviously, his divine domain. Channel Divinity and a Divine Domain feature, and that's it. So, we have to go immediately to our, PH, our PDF over here, because that's not going to help us at all. Um, so, the Divine Domain that Elminster is a part of is actually in the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. Uh, it's going to be... Classes, Clerics, Divine Domain, Arcana Domain. 
So, let's look at what we get for... Now, the, the fun thing about being a cleric-wizard combination is that it frees up spells for your spellbook later because you get uh, domain spells automatically. So, um, first we have our Divine Domain. Divine Domain, Arcana. Uh, so here's a... here. Uh, Yeah, it's, it's effectively the Magic Domain. So, we don't really get any benefit from Arcane Initiate currently as it stands. Because when you get, when you choose this domain at first level, you gain proficiency in the Arcana skill, and you gain two cantrips of your choice in the Wizard Spell List. Um, so, we're going to put that in. But we're still in character creation, and something I something I allow my players if they're making higher level characters is that if you ha if you gain something at level three that you didn't realize you gained as you were going through the numbers that you wanted that that changes something you would have picked at level one, go ahead and go back and do it. So, one of the proficiencies we picked for our wizard proficiency was Arcana. Well, the man the magic domain of the cleric sort of makes that obsolete. That being said, let's go ahead and go back because we we would have known. Uh, when we when we start, we know we knew we were going to go, be going into this domain. So let's go back and take a look at that. Because what else could we have picked for efficiency? Um, Arcana, history, insight, investigation, medicine, religion. Which one of these don't we have? Medicine. So yeah, we'll just what we'll do is, because we get this proficiency from our arcane initiate, we're just gonna go ahead and swap what would have been our wizard proficiency from Arcana to medicine. Boom. Problem solved. Everyone's happy. The point of playing D and D is to make yourself happy. Well, make people happy in general. So, problem solved. We now have a buttload of elements. Just a skill monkey. What can we say? So we have that. Uh, now we have his channel divinity. Also, this is class cleric first level. Because we haven't even gotten to his wizard stuff yet, so we're gonna chill. <clears throat> uh, Channel Divinity is Arcane Abjuration. So actually, what I, what I, what I, what I tend to do here is... Um, I, I put them like this for Channel Divinity, just because it, it helps me. Um, as an action, you... Uh, so... Wisdom saving throw the fear, or the turned effect against celestial, elemental, fey, or fiends of your choice within 30 feet. Versus turned, uh, turned for one minute. Oh, versus turned for one minute. So I'm doing our shorthand here, because again, we don't need we don't need verbatim. We just need to know what it does. Uh, all right. So we get for there. So that's our. Uh, we also get. Um, I believe we also get the standard one, which is... <laughs> yeah, we also just have uh, Turn Undead channel, channel Divinity. Which is the same thing, but against undead. Sorry, each undead instead. Not sorry. Instead of one, each undead. 
Alright, Zagrog, enjoy your rest. Each undead within sight. Wisdom save the turn. Four. One minute. Uh, within 30 feet, actually. Each undead within 30 feet. That can see you. Wisdom save the turn for me. Alright, so we've got his turn undead. We've got Arcane Adjuration, we've got turn undead, we've got all of his cleric stuff. Now, it is time for the 29 levels of wizard. So, first I want to look at something real quick, because I'm not certain, like, uh, having him be level 29 doesn't really have a whole lot of mechanical effect if there's not a mechanical effect. So I'm going to look through the DMG here and see what the rules are for going beyond level 20, if such rules exist. Um, so I'm going to go to the index here, real quick. Let's see. Beyond level 20? No. Level. Level, 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 level. I imagine it would just get us to whatever his 20th level wizard stuff is, so... Gaining levels, 131 and 261. So let's look at, let's look at these things real quick. 261 is closer. Uh, this just tells us how to... various ways to let them level up. So, then... One thirty one. Let's look at one thirty one. Let's see. That's just training to gain levels there. So nothing in the DMG that I can find. Let me double check the player's guide here. My handy dandy player's guide. Okay, so. Yeah, so there's nothing in any of the books to indicate what happens once you try to go beyond level 20. So, let's look and see if we can find out. Beyond level 20. Fifth edition D and D. So, currently the rules provide no progression beyond level 20. That being said, they don't explicitly, they don't explicitly ban it either. Oh! 
231 of the DMG, apparently, has suggestions for what to do after level 20. So let's take a look. Epic Boon. An epic boon is a special power available only to 20th level players. Characters that gain le that, at that level gain such boons only if you want them to and only when you feel it's appropriate. Epic boons are best rewarded after players complete a major quest or come up with something else particularly notable. A character might gain an epic boon after destroying an evil artifact, defeating an ancient dragon, or halting an incursion from the other planes. Epic boons can also be used in the form of advancement, a way to provide greater power to characters with no more level to gain. With this approach, consider awarding one epic boon to each character after for every 30,000 experience points he or she earns above 355,000. So, what we're going to say then is, we're going to say that you can level up beyond level 20, and this is something that will apply to my characters as well, if they ever go that far. But where um, my player characters might gain epic boons at that point, or the ability to buy more feats or do whatever, you know, we'll say every 30,000 30, experience points after, um, after level 20, you level up again, and you can gain a level in another class, and then get whatever that get whatever that provides, as well as getting something like this or something like that. So that, that that's how we'll that's how we'll rule it right now, being that we are the game master and can do that. So that being said, he can't be a level twenty nine wizard because there aren't twenty nine levels of wizard for him to have. So level twenty wizard then, which means he'll have all the stuff that a twentieth level wizard has, and he'll probably also throw in a couple extra uh, boons. For his, let's see, uh, five, six. So for the extra, for so for the extra six levels um, that he would have had to gain after uh, hit that after hitting twentieth level at level fourteen of wizard. So, bruh. All right, which means that his experience points are. Really fucking high. Actually, let's calculate what his experience points would be. So, if I have a handout here, if at level twenty we're gonna have a three five five zero 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 experience points, and he gained six more levels, so three five five zero zero zero, and he gained. Six more levels at 30,000 experience each. We go GM roll 30, 1, 2, 3, times 6. That much more experience. GM roll 355000 plus 180000 equals. Whoops. I need to not have a period there. That's how much experience Elminster has. And quite frankly, would be worth. Boom. Fixed it. Everything's good. He's got a lot of experience. I mean, you know, for an epic level character. Um, so. Let's take a look at wizards. So. He is a wizard. My problem with most of the wizard stuff in the book, is that none of it really fits Elminster. So wizards have these things called arcane traditions that they learn at level two, um, which are ways that they can cast magic better. The only problem I have with that is, well, quite frankly, um, they're not designed for a character like Elminster. For instance, um, there is a, there's an arcane tradition in the player's handbook for each school of magic, and it indicates you as a particular um, expert in that particular school. Abjuration uh, gives you, uh, you know, you you have le it takes less time for you to copy down abjuration spells, and abjuration spells in your spellbook. You get arcane wards. Ward is a thing which basically gives you a it gives you a, uh, a spell that you can add to yourself 
or, or, uh, or a shield that you can add to yourself that gives you temporary hit points. Uh, you can uh, you can push that out to other people, things like that. Um, conjuration makes you better at summoning creatures and uh, um, and makes your creatures themselves better. School of Divination makes you able to see into the future. Enchantment that you uh, gaze and charm on people. Not designed for characters like this. Sorry, but yeah, that's fair. So we're not going to use any of the. Um, we're not going to use any of the stuff in the player's handbook. Instead, we're going to use something that's going to be obsolete as soon as X, X, uh, X, uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything comes out, because they're not printing it in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. We're going to use the most broken subclass that Wizards has ever made for Unearthed Arcana. Lore Mastery. I know what you're thinking. Lore Mastery, what is that? Lore Mastery, it's what, what you're, you're good at reading books? You're... you're, you're, you're is that what it is? So, Lore Mastery is the arcane tradition fixated on understanding the underlying mechanics of magic, the, the fundamental building blocks of magic. Not only, and, but, but the thing about magic is when you understand something magic, that means you are good at manipulating that aspect of magic. So, Lore Mastery wizards do the following. At second level, they get spell secrets. Um, when you cast a spell with a spell slot, and the spell deals acid, cold, fire, force, lightning, necrotic, radiant, or thunder damage, you can substitute that damage type with one other type from that list. You can only change you can you can change only one damage type per casting of a spell. You replace one energy type for another by altering the spell's formula as you cast it. When you cast a spell on a spell slot and the spell requires a saving throw, you can change the saving throw for one ability score to another of your choice. Once you change a saving throw in this way, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. So, note that those two paragraphs do not countermand each other. You can throw a fireball that does force damage, or acid damage, or lightning damage, or thunder damage, and make the saving throw charisma, or wisdom, or intelligence, or constitution, or strength, instead of dex. And, as a note, when you do that, you completely nullify a rogue's evasion ability, because the evasion ability on a rogue specifically indicates that you only take half damage if it's a dexterity saving throw, you fail, or succeed, or whatever, or take no damage if you succeed. So, you just completely annihilate rogues with that. And the funniest thing about this uh, is... Um, the funniest thing about this is that wizards, when writing it, don't I don't think they quite understood what they were doing. Because they included a little text blurb, and to be fair, this isn't the original PDF, but this was something that was included. Altering spells. While the spell secrets feature offers increased versatility at a table, its effects can be difficult to spot by the other players. If you're playing a savant, take a moment to describe how you alter your spells. Think of a signature change your character is particularly proud of. Be inventive and make the character in, uh, and make the game more fun for everyone by playing up the sudden, unexpected tricks you can employ. For example, a fireball transformed to require a strength save might become a sphere of burning rock that shatters and slams into its targets. A charmed person that requires a constitution save might take the form of a vapor narcotic that alters the target's mood. Like, they, they, they completely no-sell the fact that you break the game with this ability, which I absolutely love and is absolutely in flavor for Elminster. So, Elminster is going to be a lore mastery wizard. So, what do we get from being a wizard? Well, let's start. Mostly we get spells. Um, most of what wizards get are spells. So, we get spellcasting, arcane recovery at level 1. We get our arcane tradition at level 2. And then it's just um, ability score improvement, arcane tradition feature, ability score improvement, arcane tradition feature, ability score improvement, arcane tradition feature, ability score improvement, spell mastery, ability score improvement, signature spell. Yes, that is a level 2 spell, and you can just do that to each spell. The saving throw change, the saving throw change you can only do once per short rest. The elemental change you can do when the fuck ever, so long as it's a spell that uses a spell slot. So it doesn't apply to signature spells, and it doesn't apply to mastery spells, things that don't actually use spell slots when you cast them. But, 
or yeah, but still fucking ridiculous. So level one spell casting we already have arcane recovery added in arcane recovery class wizard first level arcane recovery basically once so arcane recovery is for vizards um you have learned to regain some of your magical energy by studying your spell book once per day once when you finish a long when you finish a short rest you can choose to expend spell slots to recover uh, you can choose expanded spell slots to recover sorry the spell slots can uh, can have a combined level that's equal to or less than half of your wizard level rounded up and none of the slots can be of sixth level or higher for example a fourth level so so yeah I can I have effectively I have 10 levels of spells that I can recover but I can't recover anything higher than sixth so or yeah um, so we'll put that down as once per short rest, uh, once per long rest, after finishing a short rest, recover 10 levels of spells no higher than 6th than level. Boom. That's out of the way. Now we just have lore mastery stuff. So, lore master. Uh, actually, so we've run into another thing. We were previously talking about how we were using our expertise to increase our arcana, our arcana skill. But lore mastery um, doubles the proficiency bonus for any ability check you make that uses arcana, history, nature, or religion. If you are proficient in those skills, so we have to go back and fix the thing. Uh, since we're already, uh, since we're going to be effectively have expertise in all of our intelligence skills. We're going to go back and change that from Arcana to Insight. So we have expertise in Insight and Perception, and now with Lore Master, we get expertise in Arcana, History, Nature, or Religion, since we are proficient with everything but Nature, because Nature is the only one we're not proficient in. So we get a bonus expertise effectively in Arcana, History, and Religion. Man, we're a goddamn skill monkey. Look at that. Plus 17 to Arcana. Plus 17 to History. Plus 15 to Insight. Plus 11 to Investigation. Plus 9 to Medicine. Uh, plus 15 Perception. Plus 17 Religion. We would, we would passive Perception at 25. Beat that! Come on. Anyways, it's actually quite easy to do if you get a higher off level rogue. But anyways, or just a, a first level rogue with 20 Dexterity, as a matter of fact. That aside. Okay. So, we have Lore Master. Lore Master, class, wizard, second level. In addition, uh, when you roll initiative, you, uh, it is either an intelligence check or a dexterity check for you, your choice. We're going to change our initiative to intelligence. So, it's currently at two. We, that means we get a plus three to our initiative. Yeah. Boom. Spell secrets, we've already gone over. That's broken. Alchemical casting at sixth level. So here's another butte that lore that lore master wizards get, which is <laughs> uh, Pathfinder bards. Yeah, no, Pathfinder 3.5 and Pathfinder characters can get stupid. Uh, all I have to do is point back at point to Austin playing Crash in our Warcraft game uh, to to indicate that. Uh, wizards, uh, uh, sixth level. So at, at so at sixth level, lore master wizards learn to augment spells in a variety of ways. When you cast a spell with a spell slot, you can expend one additional spell slot to augment its effects for the casting, mixing the raw stuff of magic into your spell to amplify it. The effect depends on the spell you expend. You can only do one of these, 
Or elusive rather than iron. You only do one of these per spell, but uh, an additional first level spell slot increases the spell's raw force. If you roll damage for a spell when you cast it, increase the damage against every target by 2d10 force damage. Remember that fireball that did force damage that I was talking about earlier? Well, in addition to the 8d6, add another 2d10 on top of that. Or, cast it at 9th level. Roll, let's see, uh, 8d6 at 3rd level. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9... Um, so, 13, 14d6 plus 2d10 force damage, just by expending a first level spell slot. Just, boom, boom, go away. Alternatively, a second level spell slot increases the spell's range. If the spell's range is at least 30 feet, it becomes one mile. Oh, there's a town about a mile away that's really in my way. Just literal arcane artillery. And third level spell slot, yes, one mile. Uh, third level spell slot can increase the spell's potency, increasing the spell save DC by two. <laughs> Do you need line of sight? Presumably you need line of sight. So, arcane eye, go look at it. Fireball. Just a small bead of fire, just... Or Meteor Swarm. Or Gate. <laughs> Just goddamn. Finger of Death. Disintegrate. From a mile away. Yeah, no, it's, it's ridiculous. So that's how chemical casting. Uh, spend additional spell slots for additional effects. First level spell... Plus 2d10 force damage to all targets. Second level spell. Increase range if at least 30 feet to 1 mile. Third level spell. Increase DC by 2. Uh, Alright. Prodigious memory at 10th level. At 10th level, prodigious memory... Gate to Karsarai in that village mile over there, and while hideous things escaping the prison plane, overwhelming, <laughs> casually riding away eating an apple. Yeah, that's things Elminster could do. At tenth level, you have attained a greater mastery of spell preparation. As a bonus action, you can replace one spell that you have prepared with another spell from your spell book. You can't use this feature again until you finish short and long rest. I don't know why this was at tenth level, not at second level. This is far more a second level ability than a tenth level ability. Just spontaneously swapping prepped spells. That's like that. That's that makes more sense to me to be a tenth, oh, a second level ability, not. Oh, I'm just gonna throw a force. I'm just gonna throw a. Um, what are you weak to? I'm gonna throw that and with your lowest saving throw as the saving the as the DC at you. Here's a cold fireball. <laughs> Here's a. Uh, he Here's a here's a firestorm, not ice storm. Here's a you know, here's a finger of death that does radiant damage. A disintegrate that does fire damage, you know. So we can hot swap a spell with prodigious memory once per short rest. Big whoop. And master of magic at 14th level. Your knowledge of magic allows you to duplicate almost any spell. As a bonus action, you can call to mind the ability to cast one spell of your choice from any class's spell list. Let me repeat that. As a bonus action, you can call to mind the ability to cast one spell from any class's spell list. The spell must be of a level for which you have spell slots. You mustn't have prepared it, and you follow the same. Uh, you follow the normal rules for casting it, including expending a spell slot. Uh, including expending a spell slot. If the spell isn't a wizard spell, it counts as a wizard spell when you cast it. The ability to cast the spell vanishes from your mind when you cast it, uh, or when the current turns ends. You can't use this feature until you finish a long rest. Now, any class of spell is a miracle or wish or uh, any fuck heal, mass heal. 
hmm, you know, it would be really good if I could just simply, you know, spontaneously cure everyone around me. Oh, fucking wait. I can do that. Though again, by the point, by the time you get to this point, it's a little underwhelming compared to the second and sixth level spell uh, modifiers uh, for the lore match, for the lore mage. How, what, what sort of a dick would you have to be to waste that? Hmm. Well, I, can, I could do any spell that I want, but I'm just going to do it Entangling Roots from the Ranger spell list. Why not? Banishing Smite. Yes, pop. <laughs> just fucking waste it. Oh, God. Okay. Now we go back to the core wizard stuff. Because now we get to the cool shit. Uh, spell mastery at 18th level. Also, we have uh, we have a few feats that we're gonna go, or a few feats slash abilities going permits that we're gonna get to, but we'll get that in a minute. Um, uh, spell mastery class. I don't know why you went up, but class wizard uh, 18th level. So basically, uh, spell mastery at. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, I want to cast it from the Bard spell list. Um, that just like the rubbins, so that is. Uh, at 18th level, you achieved mastery, such mastery over certain spells that you can cast them at will. Choose a first level wizard spell and a second level wizard spell that are in your spell book. You can cast those spells at their lowest level without expending a spell slot when you have them prepared. If you want to cast either spell at a higher level, you must expend a spell slot as normal. By spending 8 hours instead, you can exchange one or both of those spells to choose for different spells at the same level. So, basically, what that reads to me is you have Misty Step and Shield as at-will abilities. That's what it reads to me. I might read as something else to you guys, but to me that reads Misty, Shep and Misty Step and Shield as at-will abilities. I would say Misty Step and Mage Armor as at-will abilities, but Mage Armor, not as good as Shield. Uh, because... Shield gives you a plus five to your AC, and if you're already wearing good gear, and Elminster has robes of the Archmage. If you're already wearing good armor, or armor that actually gives you a bonus or magic item or something like that, then mage armor gets outclassed quickly. And having 15 AC plus your dex plus another five on top of that is way better than just 13 plus dex to your, uh, setting your AC as 13 plus dex at will. Especially by the time you're at level 18. At level 18, you're not using that for mage armor. You're using that for fucking shield. <laughs> oh, by the way, it's first and second level. Not first or second level. So, first and second. Make a first and second level spell that you have in your spell book and prepared at will spells. It's, <laughs> the value is hard to translate. <laughs> Alright. And finally, Spell Mastery. I don't know why this keeps going upwards, but whatever. I'll fix it in a minute. Uh, wizard. 20th level. So, Spell Mastery reads... When you reach 20th level, you gain mastery over two powerful spells and can cast them with a little effort. Choose two third level wizard spells in your spellbook as your signature spells. You always have these spells prepared, they don't count as the number of spells you have prepared, and you can cast each of them once at third level without expending a spell slot. When you do so, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. 
If you want to cast either spell at a higher level, you must spend spell slots as normal. So it's, you know, it's worse than spell, uh, than sing sorry, that's signature spells, not spell mastery. Signature spells. It's worse than spell mastery, but, I mean, it's still pretty cool. We'll determine what his signature spells are later. Alright, so we've got all of his features in. Now we have to go back and, and and look at the number of... Fortunately, we only have the, the ones for Wizard because Cleric Fighter and uh, Rogue never got high enough. So we look at our Ability Score Improvement or Feat options that we have for 20th level Wizard. Um, so we have... One, two, three, four, five. We have five potential options for feats and um, for feats and um, ability score improvements. So, what do we want to do? Well, um, I know one feat that I desperately want and always want is spell sniper. So we're gonna. We're going to apply Spell Sniper here as one of our five options. Um, because if you are a mage, if you are a combat-oriented mage, or even if you're not, you always want Spell Sniper. Spell Sniper reads... Hang on one second. Let me pull up. Spell Sniper reads... Uh, you have learned techniques to enhance your attacks with certain kinds of spells, gaining the following benefits. When you cast a spell that requires you to make an attack roll, the spell's range is doubled. Your ranged spell's attacks ignore half cover and three quarters cover. You learn one cantrip that requires an attack roll. Choose the cantrip from the Bard, Cleric, Druid, Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard spell list. Your spellcasting ability for this cantrip depends on the spell you, list you choose from. Charisma for Bard, Sorcerer, for, Sorcerer uh, or Warlock, Wisdom for Cleric or Druid, or Intelligence for Wizard. So, it's not for Wizards. Wizards probably have the... Ah, fuck my leg. Wizards probably have the worst option for this, um, simply because they're the only ones that cast with intelligence, and so you can't get that benefit off of somebody else. But it's still a good thing to have, even if you've never used the cantrip you've learned. Or if you just learned another cantrip from the wizard school. So we're taking a Spell Sniper as our fourth level feat. What else do we have? Well, Warcaster is another good one. That if you if you ever want to cast spells, you probably want Warcaster. Uh, Warcaster gives you advantage on Constitution saving throws um, whenever you make that make you uh, maintain that that make you maintain concentration on the spell when you take damage. Um, you can perform the somatic components of spells even if you have weapons or a shield in one or both hands. And when a hostile creature's movement provokes an attack, uh, an attack of opportunity from you, you can use your reaction to cast a spell at that creature, rather than making an opportunity attack. So, uh, combined with our close quarter shooter uh, fighting style, that means that if somebody tries to move away from us, we can use our reaction to go... Disintegrate. <laughs> hmm, I see you're trying to run away from Elminster. Disintegrate. Or, hold person. <laughs> so we're going to take Warcaster for our sixth level uh, feat. I'm oh, sorry, eighth level feat. Sorry, not sixth level. That's it. I'm singing fighter for some reason. Eighth level. What else do we have? So, um... Hmm. Hold monster, harder to save against. Yeah. Um... Hmm. Magic Initiate gets us another first level spell. Probably don't care about that too much, though. Um, observant. Quick to notice details in your environment, you gain one of the following benefits. Increase your intelligence or wisdom score by one. Wisdom. 
um, to a maximum of 20. If you can see a creature's mouth while it is speaking a language you understand, you can interpret what it's saying by reading its lips, and you get a plus 5 bonus to your passive wisdom perception and passive intelligence investigation. I think we're going to take the observant feat for our level 12 feat. Because getting our wisdom to 18 and getting a passive plus five to our getting a plus five to our passive wisdom seems to be good now that we have a passive perception of 31 mm. Mm. tastes good okay so we have three more 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 so we can just use the remaining three ability score improvements that we have to take our dexterity to take our dexterity up to 20 because we're going to be getting six epic boons for having passed into epic levels so i think we're just going to do that and see what we can get on the epic boon side of things Wabam! All right, so our dexterity is now 20, which gives us a passive AC of 15 when wearing no armor. We're going to be getting the robes of the Archmage, um, so we're going to actually... So let's go ahead and grab some of our magical items that Elminster has. Uh, to do this, I simply go back in here, and I'm going to go... Uh, I'm going to turn my uh, able pop... Uh, sorry, uh, use window pop-outs for characters off. So when I pull Elminster in, he's here. Go to my 5th uh, edition compendium here, and Robes of the Archmage. So here's a fun thing about using Roll20 for, for, uh, for those of you that don't. Uh, Archmage. Yeah. Robes. Items. I know you come up. I've seen you come up before. Oh, robe is what well, I, I believe. A robe's not robe. Okay, robe. Okay. So, if you have a. If you have a um, if you have an uh, an item that you know you want to add to a character, even if it's a player character or an NPC, you can f if you can find it in the compendium on roll twenty, you can just go, boop, and it will automatically put them in. Sometimes it fucks up and gives me an armor class of thirty. I need to check that out. I need to see why that's happening. Actually, I just need to fix it because um, it's supposed to make. Um, 15 plus dex mod. So let me fix that real quick. There we go. AC 20. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, what are the circumstances for elements to see combat? Clearly he isn't designed to fight a party. Well, not without murdering them. So is he meant to be a near immortal quest giver who has all of this so no one can mess with him? Or perhaps a deus ex machina if you want to pull a party out of a really bad situation? Any and all of the above. Uh, typically, you will not have your party fight Elminster. And I'm not making Elminster to have my party fight him. I'm making him more as a tutorial for how I make NPCs. Um, and as you can see, it's already taken us almost two hours to make Elminster. I go, we're probably going to only make Elminster today. Um, Elminster serves a variety of purposes in any sort of D&D setting. He can be a deus, he can absolutely be a deus ex machina if you just need somebody to pop in and go, Hey, you all look like you're extremely fucked. Let me get you out of that mess. Foom! You can do that. Um, he's, chaotic, he's a chaotic good entity, so if it seems likely for him to do that, he can absolutely do it. Um, the biggest thing about Elminster is that he is the chosen of the goddess of magic. So he is sort of at the he's sort of at the crux of a lot of quests, a lot of uh, epic battles, a lot of you know stories might revolve around finding him, getting him to help you, surviving the various dungeons he's made. Um, any number of things. He is functionally immortal. Um, 
So, yeah, you give him all this stuff just so that you have a rule set for him in the unlikely event that your that your um, in the unlikely event that your party wants to try to fuck with him. Um, and that's pretty much how I that, that that's 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 why you make that's why you stat out NPCs of great power. Characters that you know it's unlikely your players want to fight, but in case they do, give them a target. That way they, you know, give them a, give them, give the NPC stats. That way, maybe your players surprise you. Um, maybe, maybe your players want to fight Elminster and they have a really clever plan that might actually work. In that case, you want to have him stat it out. Um, so that's why I'm statting him out. I don't, I don't know if Elminster will ever... Elminster might feature in Grand Terror Rebirth. I don't know if he will, but um, this is more just a primer for how I do things. Uh, I stat out all of my major NPCs like this. Um, all of all any 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 person that I don't pull out of my ass, I go through this process for. I I, I, I figure out <coughs> what their class is, what their features are, what they do, what their story is behind that. Yeah, yeah, he, he, you can very much describe him as a reverse Darth Vader. You can describe him as Darth Vader, too, in fact, for depending on your characters and your character's party. Um, but yeah, I... Yeah, you... Elminster, more often than not, serves as a crux for a plot rather than an obstacle for a plot. <laughs> or a big, shiny MacGuffin. Anyways. So, we give him the Row of the Archmages... We give him the staff of the Archmages, or staff of the Magi, and uh, that's really all we actually need to give him. Um, Elminster can have any item you want him to have. Uh, you don't need to give. You don't need to come up with an excuse for it. So, I'm just giving him those two and letting him sit there with those. Uh, which, with with the um, with the rules of uh, attunement as they are in fifth edition, that means he has two out of three attunement slots full. <sighs> um, so we're almost done with Elminster. He has twenty six hit dice of varying types. Um, we know that a wizard hit dice is his first one, but let's go. But first, we have we have six levels past the epic levels that we need to give him a thing for because we because. We're, we're operating under the assumption that if our players go past level 20, then they're going to get epic boons every once in a while. So, since Elminster did, he's getting them too. Um, because Elminster is also something you can aspire to be in my in, when I play D&D. Like, if you really, really, if you really, 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 really want to get to the level that Elminster is at, you can absolutely do it in my games. It just takes a lot of time and dedication. So, let's look at Epic Boons on 231 of the DMG. Alright, so, Epic Boons are things that you can give players after they've find, you know, maxed their level out. And you can give them to, you can give it to them whenever they want, however they want, whatever they want, and, and sort of describe what it does, however you want. These are basically just things that modify the character in a drastic way. Uh, for instance, um, we're going to give him the boon of quick casting. What is the boon of quick casting, you might ask? Well, um, boon of quick casting. Other. Epic boon for level 21. Epic boon for level 21. Choose one of your spells of first through third level that has a casting time of one action. That spell's casting time is now one bonus action for you. That's pretty damn good. So just randomly, one of his first, second, or third level spells is going to be a bonus action. Probably going to be Magic Missile, if I'm quite honest. Bonus action Magic Missile seems pretty choice. Uh, what else can we give him? 
Boon of Spell Mastery. Seems like another thing that might be appropriate for, uh, for, um, Elminster. Epic Boon for level 22. Choose one first level spell. Uh, uh, Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard spell that you can cast. You can now cast that spell at its lowest level without expending a spell slot. So, bonus action magic missile for free? Constantly? Seems legit to me. Or, bonus action witch bolt for free? Constantly. That's also good. There's lots of, there's lots of interesting things we could do for that. Bonus action mage armor for no value, if we were that kind of character. Um, so we've got six of these. That's two. We've got four left. And these can all be found in the DMG, in a lovely little list of boons. And you can also make up your own boons if you want. I'm not going to do that because I don't have that kind of time. But... <sighs> What else, what else should we give him? Boon of True Sight? Basically just gives him True Sight? Yeah, that's an Elminster thing to have. Boon of True Sight. True Sight of 60 feet. He just has True Sight for 60 feet. Fuck you and your stealth. And a big boon for level 23. Ah, uh, there's another one that he definitely has. Boon of High Magic. Epic boon for level 24. You gain one ninth level spell slot, provided that you already have one. So now he has two ninth level spell slots instead of one. Just, mm. Good, that's glorious. Glorious! Um, here's another one that we've already spoken of, but this just makes it official. Boon of Immortality. Epic boon for level... level 25. You stop aging. You are immune to any effect that would age you. And you can't die from old age. That was given to him by Mistra a long time ago, but mechanically we'll say it's his 25th level boon. And finally, his last boon. Hmm. Lots of good options here. Boon of irresistible offense. Epic boon for level 26. You can bypass the damage resistances of any creature. Alright. So we've got a pretty well kitted out Elminster here. Um, I like to assume that for Elminster he knows all spells. Uh, and has no problem casting any of them, but we are going to put together some of his basic spell package. Uh, that's And that's primarily because um, we know a few of the spells that he does know. And we want to make sure that those spells are in his spell list just in, just in case um, he needs to do something in combat. Um, just in case somebody, you know, one of the party tries to attack him. So... Another fun thing about Roll20, using Roll20 for character sheets, is again, in just like items, you can pull spells into it. Now, the Compendium isn't complete and doesn't have all the spells that you could possibly want or need, but it does have a lot of them, uh, especially if you've bought any of the Wizards of the Coast material for Roll20. Like, any Adventurers League stuff will include with it a lot of the Compendium things, like, uh, you know, like the stuff that's most of the stuff that's in Player's Handbook. 
I think you can buy, and if you buy any of the material that you can, and I think there's also material you can buy for Roll20 that expands the compendium. So first of all, we have Shield. And we've already noted that Shield is one of his spell mastery spells. So in order to differentiate it from the others so we know it doesn't use a spell slot, we're going to go uh, Mastery. It's one of his master, mastery spells. Um, magic Missile, we know he has as a domain spell for his Cleric. So we have Magic Missile. Uh, domain. Uh, Misty Step, we know we want him to have as another mastery spell. Mastery. Um, he doesn't need mage armor because he's got the Robe of the Archmage, so screw that. What else does he have? Um, first of all, we know he has a second ninth level spell. So we have to go down here and go. Plus one. Well, there's two ninth level spells, only one eighth level spell. That's kind of fun. Anyways. What else might he have? Well, let's just pull up our Andy Denny spell list. Let's see. Actually, what we should do first is determine how many spells can he have prepared. So as a wizard, all spellcasters can only have a certain amount of spells prepared. As a wizard, he knows five cantrips, first of all, and he can prepare a number of spells equal to his intelligent modifier plus his wizard level. So. Uh, his intelligence modifier is 5, his wizard level is 20, so he can prepare 25 spells per day. The mastery spells count against those. Domain spells do not. So I don't have to have missed, I don't have to have magic missile prepared. It's just there. I know it. And my boons that might apply to it don't specify that the spell has to be prepared, which is important and relevant. So, uh, Shield Mastery, Magic Missile, Misty Step. What else does he have for his mastery stuff? Well, let's find out. Spark Coast Adventurers. Um, so, at first level, he gets Detect Magic and Magic Missile. And then at third level, he gets Magic Weapon and Nistal's Magical Aura as automatic spells. So, Detect Magic, Magic Weapon, and Magic Aura are more things that he needs to have. Detect Magic as a domain spell. Magic Aura. The Compendium on Roll20 also changes the names of something, so if it's a named spell, look for the non-named component of it, like Magic Aura instead of Nistel's Magic Aura, for instance. Um, no, and, um, what was the other one? Um, Magic Weapon. <laughs> and so these are all Domain. 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 <laughs> Alright, so we've got his domain spells, we've got his mastery spells. Let's, let's figure out what his signature spells are going to be. And what his five standard cantrips are. So, we'll start with the cantrips. Cantrips. Um, wizards have a lot of cantrips. Wizards have the most cantrips options, so... Uh, just going with stuff out of the... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, Morton Kanan's disjunction is Medivh's disjunction in, uh, Warcraft RPG. Although the disjunction spell does not exist in 5th edition anymore, and I'm very sad about that, but... <clears throat> uh, Firebolt is a yes. Yeah, he has a- he has Firebolt. Come on. Firebolt and Shocking Grasp. Um, come on, come on, little twenty. You can do it. You can do it. There it is. Okay. Um, he has 
message. Mage hand. Prestidigitation. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, he has a couple other cantrips from other features, but we're not going to worry about that right now because I'm not worried about it. Um, actually, for a spell sniper spell, we'll give him Ray of Frost. Just to round it out. For a spell sniper spell. While we wait, um, he does have a passive bonus. to all ranged attacks. Hmm. <laughs> well, we don't have, um, we don't have the ability to, to, to show it right now, but we'll, we'll, we'll worry about it later. Um, Ooh, global attack modifier field. Hey, there we go. Uh, that's damage. I want... Oh, look, I can add sneak attack to there. Hey. 1d6 sneak attack. Uh, oh, okay, I see, I see, I see, I see. I see what this is. Plus. Plus one. Plus one. Ranged attacks. So if I do a fireball, it has a plus one to it automatically. That's nice. And if I do a sneak attack, 1d6 sneak attack, I can get that sneak attack in there without having to roll the extra one if I don't want to. Global modifiers are really great in this. Just remember to turn them off, because if you don't... <laughs> Anyways. Um, so we have his cantrips. I think he's missing one, but I'll worry about that later. Um, what are his signature spells? So we have a couple of third level spells that are his signature spells. Um... I mean, I, I guess it has... One of them... I guess it has to be Firebolt and Lightning. Very, very frightening. Uh, sorry, Fireball and Lightning. That one. Has to be Fireball and Lightning... And, and uh, Lightning Bolt. Because those are sort of the preeminent... You know, spell. <laughs> also, he definitely has counter spell. What else? Is, what else does he definitely have? Um. Uh, he definitely has Gaius. Mm. Animate objects. Yes, he does. Polymorph. And true polymorph. Because he's a dick like that. Fly... He has Morden Kane's Magnificent Mansion, which in this case is Magnificent Mansion. Uh. Yeah, he probably has Morden Kane's Sword as well, which is just Arcane Sword in this. Uh, clone. Actually, he probably doesn't have Clone. 
close by one of the few spells he doesn't have. Unless he wants to have it. But he does have Feeble Mind. And Flesh to Stone. And Disintegrate. Does 5th edition have Polymorph any object? Uh, poly yes, Polymorph you can turn people into objects as well. Yeah, Polymorph can turn people into anything else, creatures or objects. Modify memory. Yeah, they, they, they did a lot of compressing in 5th edition. They have took, like, all the various polymorph spells and just made them polymorph. Cure Wounds is only on, on first level, which he probably also has Cure Wounds. Being a cleric and having access to that. of death power word he probably has all of the power words both power word stun and power word kill um wish One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. We still have like six more spells he could probably have, but well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna fill out all of his spells. Just sort of giving an idea of the things that I know he can do. Um. Uh, teleport, obviously, and planar shift. Teleport. Teleportation circle. Plane shift. Oh. Uh, eh. We don't want to load him down with nine gold balls. But yeah, so. He has a lot of options, is what we're saying. And so that's basically it for. Oh, now we have to roll his hit dice. So. You can do one of two things. You can either roll hit. So, uh, you can do one, as a GM, you can do one of three things with with NPCs. You can either roll their hit dice. You can use the uh, half plus one, which is half the hit dice plus one, um, plus your Constitution modifier. Or you can just give them maximum whatever their hit points would be if for NPCs. And so for Elminster, I'm going to give him maximum whatever his hit points would possibly be. So we've got GM roll. Uh, 10 plus 5 times 8 plus 29 times 6. He has 224 hit points. Doesn't seem like a lot, but it's... He's immortal anyways, so if you, if you take him down... If you A, hit him, and B, take him down that much, then congratulations. Um. There are certainly other player characters that could get that much, like, like, you know, just thinking about it, like, um, if I had a 20 constitution, if I was a, barbar a level 20 barbarian with 20 constitution, I could theoretically have... 12 plus, or so 12 times 20 plus uh, 5 times 20. Yeah, like a, like a 20th level barbarian could definitely, could theoretically definitely have more hit points than Elminster. But, that's not the point of Elminster. Because Elmen you come at Elminster, he bonus action, hold person, action, power word, kill, or whatever. 
so yeah. We have Elminster all set and ready to go. If he ever encounters my poor, poor players. They don't want to... They don't want to deal with him. So, actually, um... We got an hour left in the stream. I don't think I have a whole lot more time. I don't have I don't have enough time to make another character, but that just sort of shows the pro oh, oh, one last thing we have to do before I finish out. So I made a token for Elminster. I have to now work I have to now set this token to be Elminster. So I will go Elminster. Show nameplate. Hit points. AC. I'm gonna make this 50 because the the uh, staff of the magi the staff of the magi has uh, power points that it can use to you can use it to cast spells in place of or as charges that it can use to cast spells in place of your spell slots. So, um, so yeah, and, and it's maximum charges are 50. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's Elminster with 20 AC and the ability to shield for 25. Uh, I've got him all set up there. So now I go here and go, you select the token, save. So now, if I want to very quickly bring Elminster out on the field, I can go, boom, 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 boom. And if, and if you ever come across a site like five Elminsters in a row staring at you, you're probably going to die. But yeah, so that's Elminster, the chosen of the chosen of Mistra, uh, the most powerful spellcaster one uh, uh, the the realm of Faerun has ever known, and now a medium creature token on a blank field in roll twenty, fully shouted out for fifth edition D and D. So, thank you all for joining me. For this adventure, as we made on the surf, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're, yeah, we're, we're definitely gonna call it here. Um, it's been fun. I, I enjoy making NPCs, and as you can tell, it takes me a long time to make them. And like just looking at the list of NPCs I've made for Grand Terra, I've made one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, uh, 39. I've made almost 40, NP 40 individual NPCs using that method um, in my, just for Grand Terra, Rebirth Along. Um, what that does, and so 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 to, to sort of wrap up, I I, I heartily advocate for uh, dungeons for DMs out there. If you're making a named NPC or someone that you intend to be a, uh, an important uh, faction or important factor in your player characters' lives, feel free to make them like you would make a PC. What that does, in addition to in addition to uh, helping you sort of get an idea as to what their power concept is, it familiarizes you with the systems that you're working with, which means that you're going to you're going to be able to answer questions a lot quicker than having to resort to the book because you've spent this time building these characters, so you're familiar with how the mechanics work because you've been reading them over and over again. But you but just reading rules is boring, so you've been reading rules in order to fulfill the task of creating characters. So it familiarizes you with the mechanics. Second, it makes your characters more believable and more real because you know where they're coming from. You know a little bit about their backstory. You know what their background is. You you have written uh, an assertion as to what their personality is like um, just by doing the background, just by filling in the backgrounds. And you know where they stand in comparison to power levels of your party. Um... If you make a fifth level, if you make a fifth level sorcerer, you know he is equivalent to a fifth level member of your party. Probably could go one on one with a member of your party. That's a, that 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 foregoes the need of having to figure out what challenge rating you're going to be putting this person at because 
one fifth level player character is not enough to take out a whole party of fifth level player characters. Maybe a whole party, you know, of, if he has a whole party with him, then might, that might be a thing. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it forgoes the need of making of coming out with challenge ratings for your custom NPCs. It forgoes the need to um, to to research stuff because as you're as you're familiarizing yourself with this book by making these characters, you're going to be able to answer those questions a lot faster, and it makes your characters more memorable. Um, it, it, your you, your players will remember a character that you spent two hours making. A lot more than they'll remember one that you just that you just you know spent 30 minutes making. In my opinion, that that might not be true in every case. I know I know there are some like throwaway NPCs that get garner a lot of attention, a lot of support, and a lot of love. But when you're making a, when you're trying to make a memorable villain, taking the time, or even a memorable ally, taking the time to figure out how they work internally is definitely worth it. Um, so yeah, I, I hardly advocate this for, for this and other systems. I, I use this very same setup for making NPCs for our uh, L5R game. In fact, making the sensei of my player, the sensei characters of my player characters in L5R has helped me understand their mechanics, the mechanics of their players a lot better so that when they have questions, I can answer them. So, this has been Let's Make NPCs with D&D. If, if you guys like it, uh, like, comment, subscribe below uh, on YouTube, or subscribe here on on Twitch if you're watching on Twitch, Twitch or give us a give us a couple bucks on Patreon. Um, and I might do more of this. If you guys want to see me create a wholly original character, uh, you know, take, take a couple of hours to create a wholly original character in the same manner, uh, I might come back and do that. I am not opposed to it. We we, we, we started off with Elminster just because that's a, that's a known location that I can build from. Um, if you guys like it, we'll do a, we'll, we'll we'll do sort of a chat vote. Give me a name, give me a race, give me a class, and we'll see what we can build and what interesting stories we can tell with this NPC. So yeah, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time. Bye.